So um, as we begin today's webinar, again, we're going to be talking about the importance of broker relations in apartment syndication. Um, brokers, for those of you that don't know, we're talking about real estate brokers, specifically multifamily uh, real estate brokers. Um, these are not, you know, there's broker can be assigned to different things, real estate brokers and single family or many different commercial or even in, you know, the financial industry, but we're talking about multifamily real estate brokers. And we want to go over kind of how to establish relationships, how to keep those relationships and how to build on those relationships. So those are the things we're going to be going over today. So be sure, take some notes. This is my direct, um, Role with passinvesting.com. We, um, I am over acquisitions uh, with our company, so I am speaking directly with all of these brokers. Often, I'm touring the properties with these brokers, um, and that's kind of my role. So I want to try to give you as much of the knowledge that I've attained over the course of the time that we've been purchasing multifamily, and kind of just hand that off to you and give you some great um, content that will help you grow and. I think you're going to like the way I've kind of tried to do this because I've gotten some direct feedback from the brokers themselves that I work with. And uh, so we'll get into that a little bit later, but, you know, we want to start off right away talking about um, who are the brokers. And again, I've, I've talked about this multiple times. We at PassiveInvesting.com are large multifamily syndicators. We tend to purchase assets you know, greater than 20 million, uh, you know, or between 20 million and 100 million. That's our range that we like to look for. Um, we like to look for class B to class A assets, uh, mostly stabilized assets. So this, most of this content is going to apply to that, but um, to, and the brokers that we work with, but you can, the relationship side of this will apply to whatever size syndication you're looking at. If you're looking at a, a five plex, you know, a 20, unit it all is going to um, apply to you in some way on the relationship side of things because just like in uh, investor relations the same thing applies to broker relations they have to know like and trust you you've heard that multiple times from dan and danny and myself the brokers also have to know like and trust you um, in order for them to transact with you so we're going to kind of go over how to do that and what we've done as a group, and I, and I can say that confidently that that works because as I was asking these brokers the questions that we're going to go over today, they gave me the answers and then they said at the end, and this happened with, uh, I, I texted seven brokers and all of them responded with their answers and then just like your group does. And that's a compliment to us. Um, we're very glad that they feel that way and we want to keep that relationship going. So we're gonna go ahead and uh, jump into the content. So the first thing on the list is who are the major brokers for multifamily real estate? Um, and so this is gonna vary a little bit per market, but your national brokers is who I'm gonna to refer to here. There's a plethora of local smaller brokers that will get um, some larger deals. Um, typically they're, they're not, the smaller brokers are not going to have like a full listing. They're going to get authorization to feel the market and, and see if they can get some offers, but they don't have an official listing. That's not always the case, but that does tend to be the case most of the time with the larger assets. Um, it's going to be these big national groups that, um, are going to be having the listing on these big multifamily properties. Um, but on the smaller side of things, get to know your, your smaller brokers. And that's really an easy Google search to find out who's operating in your area, just multifamily brokers in whatever market you're in, and then you know just reach out and make contact. So let's go over who we deal with on a regular basis in the large multifamily syndication source. A lot of you know this um, and have been in contact with them, but you need to know who they are so you can go to their, their site, you can get on their mailing list so you can get deals. Most of these brokers will ask you for some criteria, what you're looking for, because not everybody's looking for the same thing. And they don't want to be, you don't want to be looking at deals that don't meet your criteria. And they don't want to be sending you deals that don't meet your criteria. It's just kind of um, a improper use of everyone's time. So they're going to ask you some criteria questions, which market you're in, what type of deals you're looking for, um, the size of deal and different things like that. So um, I'm going to start 
um, off by listing the brokers that we work with. Um, almost all of these we have transacted with, um, with the exception really of there's three that we have not yet. We have been close and been the best and final, but haven't really had the chance to pull that trigger, um, but still building that relationship. So um, in order, our first deal that we did, uh, this is a Greenville property uh, we did with Capstone. Capstone is located in Charlotte, North Carolina. They cover much of the Southeast, but they also have properties all over the U.S. Um, so they're an up and coming firm. Um, they um, have some great properties. They know the, the market and uh, you know, they were the first ones to give us a shot um, on a property. And so we built off that relationship. Capstone is a great um, firm to get in contact with, especially in the Southeast. Um, and then our next deal um, came from Cushman and Wakefield. Uh, a lot of you are from, more familiar with that. Cushman and Wakefield operates internationally, um, but in the multifamily space, we deal with most of their brokers in the Southeast. Um, we have expanded our market to cover um, some um, more uh, westerly markets and in the Florida submarkets as well, and they cover those as well. So some of those bigger, um, some of those bigger uh, firms will cover more areas. Some of the smaller firms, you know, they might know some contacts out west um, or different places, but not as much. Um, we've got a comment here that some. Um, people are working with Capstone right now. So Capstone is a great group. We've, we've worked extensively with them on both sides of the aisle purchase and uh, sale. So do, they do a great job. Um, and so we have Capstone, we have Cushman Wakefield. Um, the next deal that we closed was with uh, NKF, Newmark, Knight and Frank. Um, they're sometimes known as ARA. Um, but they um, are going by NKF. I think they were purchased, ARA was purchased by NKF. So a really big firm, again, they operate internationally. Um, and then our next deal was with JLL. Um, and they are a very big firm um, operating internationally again. And they have multiple arms, but their multifamily arm obviously is who we're dealing with, but they, they deal in all aspects of real estate. And then the three groups that we have not yet had a chance to transact with our CBRE. CBRE, um, we've come very close. We had a lot of communications. I'm talking with them now on a couple of deals in the Southeast region. Um, great people, uh, great team. And um, so I'm working, hopefully, I'm trying to get a deal with them, try to um, lock that up. Um, Walker and Dunlap um, is another uh, Walker and Dunlap investment group. They operate uh, multifamily, they're also a uh, debt broker. So your agency, bridge, different things like that. So they work on both sides. And I'll back up just a little bit. A lot of these brokerage firms do have a debt arm and some of them do like you to use their debt arm. And um, we'll talk about that a little bit more in building the relationship and try to use you know uh, their debt arm as much as possible. But um, the, uh, and the next is Bricadia. Uh, Bricadia, um, I don't see as many deals from them um, just because of our criteria size and, the, and the, what they tend to offer, but I have had good conversations with them. Every once in a while, we get one that matches and we'll start that conversation. Um, Marcus and Millichap is the last one I'll, I'll mention. They, um, we have not seen much in the Southeast, but they may be more active, you know, maybe in Texas or, uh, you know, the Arizona markets, different things like that. So those are the major ones um, that we, um, work with on a regular basis that we've built relationships with and that we know the brokers uh, on a regular basis. And so we want to get in next to how to establish the initial relationship with those brokers. You know, so great. That's, these are the brokers. Um, you have your submarket. You find out who the individual brokers are for these firms in your specific submarket. So how do you get to know them? What, you know, what's the first step in doing that? Um, there are different mindsets on how to do this. Uh, we want to make sure, uh, I mean, there's no necessarily right or wrong way, but I, I will give you some feedback, both the way we did it and both uh, some of the ways that the brokers have advised that it take place. So the first thing you want to do, as I already mentioned, you want to go to their website. You want to go ahead and get signed up for their deal flow and be receiving their emails on deal flow based on your criteria. That's step number one. 
Um, step number two um, is to, to establish a personal contact meeting with the local broker in your submarket. So if you see a deal um, come through that uh, meets your criteria and is in your submarket, um, then go ahead and schedule a meeting with uh, the broker, a tour of the property. You can tour the property um, and get to know them at that point. Um, tell them who your group is, uh, what your you know business plan is, and kind of uh, you know really sell yourself to the broker. Um, and that's a great way um, to establish initial contact. The other way to do that is just to schedule a meeting um, and just go through. You can hit your submarkets like you know Charlotte, for instance. You can go up and schedule meetings with all the brokers that cover Charlotte in for all the firms that I just mentioned. And you can set up, you know, coffee or whatever and try to get in front of them face to face, let them ask you questions, answer those questions and just get that initial contact going. Um, because, you know, there's so many people bidding on um, properties. They want to kind of vet you, make sure you're not just a tire kicker, make sure you're going to be a viable group. They're going to want to know where your equity is coming from, you know, different things like that. Have you purchased a deal before? Is this your first deal? And I will say that getting your first deal from in multifamily is going to take a little bit of work. It's going to take a little bit of trust on the broker side to go ahead and award that deal to you um, if they've never transacted with you before. Um, so you want to do it as much as possible to build their confidence level in your group. Um, and so that kind of you know, leads us to the next step is how to build trust between yourself and the broker. Um, when I first receive a deal from a broker, um, my very first question is, what is the guidance and what is the CFO? That's the call for offer date. The, the guidance is the pricing. It's either going to be in a per door format or it's going to be in a total uh, property uh, format. So, you know, whatever it is, you know, 150 per door, 210 per door, whatever the case may be, it's a, either a per door um, or a total property guidance. They're giving you that guidance based on their BOV, broker's opinion of value. That's the number that they have given to the seller because um, when the seller is getting ready to sell a property, um, they go to the brokers and they get BOVs. They might get BOV, BOVs from multiple brokers and they're going to go maybe with the broker that gave them the most optimistic BOV or what they can get the highest return on. So they're going to look at the property financials. The broker is, is going to look at the property financials and look at the market, look at the sales comps, and they're going to come up with a BOV. The seller's expectations are going to be set around that BOV. And the commission that the broker is going to receive is going to be based on that BOV. And it's going to be a hockey stick commission. It's going to be a commission that says, if we achieve this, this is our commission. And for every whatever, 10,000 above that, it's going to go up. So it's definitely an incline once they pass the BOV value. So when you ask for guidance, the broker um, is it wants to make money just like you and I. They have a family to feed, they have bills to pay, and they want to sell the property for as much as possible within reason, whatever the market will support. And so the guidance that they are giving you is going to be based on their market research. It's going to be based on the expectation of the seller. Um, and it's going to be based on what they can get for commission. So if you receive guidance from a broker, um, let's say it's you know, $14 million is, is the guidance. Uh, the first thing I want you to understand is that is entry guidance. That is not what it's going to trade for. That is where you should start underwriting the deal to see if it makes sense. But you're going to want to give yourself some room based on, you know, the deal size, whatever percentage you, you think it's going to move. But you want to go ahead and put in your offer um, right at the guidance. You can go a little bit under, but you know, if you, if you get a guidance of 14 million and, and you put an offer at 12 million or 10 million, I can almost guarantee you're going to be immediately discounted as a viable group. So here you have, you've gone onto the website, you've gotten the deal flow, you've found a deal, you've met with a broker, you toured the, with the broker, you know, you, you built up a little bit of relationship there. And then your very first interaction with them on a deal is for you to not listen to what they said and underbid their guidance by a large amount. It's going to hurt your ability to grow in the industry. So that's my 
main, I think my main guidance would be to pay attention to the guidance. If you cannot get close to that, uh, that's fine. That's understandable. Not all return metrics work for every group. Everybody has their own type of returns that they're trying to achieve. And, you know, that's okay. But that's where the next step of building trust comes in is to communicate early and often. Just go ahead and have that conversation. If you're going to have to submit a bid and it's going to be that far under, I wouldn't bother. Um, the other thing, the other piece of guidance that you want to get is where is the best and final cutoff? So they're going to give you a guidance. Let's use the, the 14 million. And they may say, well, as it, get as it gets closer to the call for offers date or the CFO, they're going to, you're going to be in communication with them. You're going to be talking to them. Where's, where do you feel it's playing out? Um, because the, the guidance may have adjusted a little bit once the deal, um, has been fully, um, marketed and maybe it's coming in a little bit lighter and they feel, you know, guidance um, for best and final cutoff is going to be around 13.5. Best and final cutoff, um, I'll explain this pretty quickly. So you have initial offers. That's where everybody who's looked at the deal submits um, in a bulk and the brokers weed through those based on price or viability of the group and they have a best and final round. That's usually going to weed it down from around 30 groups to about five groups, but I've seen it as high as 10 groups in the best and final. So a lot of times what I'll do is just say, hey, just, I want to know, I, I got your guidance. I've underwritten the guidance, uh, but where's best and final cutoff? I want to make sure I get into that final group. And then I'll submit right at that best and final cutoff or just a little bit above the best and final cutoff to get in that second round. And then I can sharpen my pencils a little bit um, get a little bit more aggressive on pricing and move that needle up once I'm in the group of five. Um, Cause you, you don't want to, you know, spend all of your fuel in the initial offering. Um, I don't want to get too much into deal terms, but I don't want to uh, put a lot of weight on terms at this point. That's going to be for the best and final round. So hard money, due diligence period, different things like that. I'm saving all that for best and final. So um Another way to build trust, let's say um, you've built a relationship with this group um, and you're offering, but you can't get to their guidance, okay? It's 14 million um, and you can only get up to 12 million. It just doesn't work for you. And that, that happens a lot. You know, we, we had a few deals uh, this week uh, or last week uh, um, that it just didn't work for us. Um, you know, they got offers in at their guidance. And so I'm gonna kind of bow out. Um, but what I always ask the brokers is, do you need me to submit an offer? It's called a pad offer. Let's say, um, you know, it's, you know, something turned in the market and they're, they're not getting as much response as they would like. They still need to sell the deal and they need to show the seller a good market survey. So if they only get one bid at their guidance and five bids below their guidance, the the seller is going to be like, I don't think your BOV was correct. And, you know, maybe we made a mistake in choosing you to sell this deal. A pad offer helps the broker give a good market survey. And, you know, he'll ensure that you aren't, you know, committing yourself to something, <laughs> uh, you know, and, and hurting a relationship there. But um, that is directly from brokers. Um, I, I got that feedback actually this morning so, from some brokers. So I always ask that question if they don't need it and they have plenty of offers and guidance, then good, great. Uh, sorry, this didn't work out. We'll see you on the next one. No harm, no foul. Uh, if they do need one, I'll go ahead and submit it. Um, I'll just submit it right at uh, best under best and final cutoff. So I'm not in that final group, but it still gives a good market survey. So um, let me give one second while we digest all that I just went through to kind of scroll through um, the uh, comments. Um, is everybody seeing the Multifamily Investor Nation webinar uh, registration page? Just give me a, a yes in the, okay, good. I, I had a couple comments about mo moving screen or something. So, um, so I'm gonna go back through these. There's quite a few, so I'm not gonna be able to go through all of them and then I'll continue on with the content. Um, Yeah, um, that's a great point, uh, Jeffrey. Um, Kirkland uh, is a big broker in the Tennessee market. 
Um, they don't really come into the Carolinas very much, but Tennessee, if you're in the Tennessee market, uh, Kirkland is a very good group to go with. Um, they, they're a little bit smaller on the size than we tend to deal with, but they are, are, are a very respected group. So thank you for reminding me of that. Um, thoughts on a, using a buyer broker versus just the listing agent. Um, is there an advantage in the realm that we play in? Um, there is no such thing as a buyer broker. That is me. <laughs> I am the um, acquisition specialist. Uh, I am brokering on our behalf. Um, in the smaller space, um, you may see that, you know, in your five plexes or, you know, it's kind of under 20 units, you may see, a, have a buyer's broker, but that's not something that I am as familiar with. So I'm not going to, you know, uh, guide you on that. Um, but in the space that we play in, there is no such thing as a buyer's broker. Um, okay. I think I've answered most of those. Um, okay, one question that we have is most broker OMs seem to be based on unrealistic and inflated pro forma numbers where the deals that you close on actually price correctly by the brokers from the beginning. Um, the OM offering memorandum is really just good reading for right before I go to bed to make sure I understand the deal and all of the aspects of the deal, like how many units have been renovated, what's the uh, premium they're getting on the renovated rents, how many are left, what's the unit mix. Um, and that's about it. Uh, the market, we've already done the research on that. Um, the rent comps I'm checking, uh, the premium is always inflated uh, typically, um, and they're going to um, add in maybe some other income, but I don't want to get too off track on that. Um, so I want to focus on more of the broker relations um, side of things. Um, so We've talked about how to build trust between yourself and the brokers. Um, communicate, communicate early and often. Um, you know, get in front of them. Um, and the biggest thing, if if you have built enough trust for them to award you a deal, on that very first deal, make sure, make sure, make sure. And I'll say it again: make sure you have underwritten enough padding to foresee any type of variance that you find in the due diligence. Uh, within reason. The reason I say that is you do not want to come in on your very first deal. This broker's taking a chance on you. They say, I believe in you and they award you the deal. And the first thing you do is come back and try to nickel and dime on a retrade for a bunch of garbage. You know, like you've already toured the property. You should have done your due diligence. So if you saw a little bit of rot on the fascia and there's a light bulb out in the hallway, they don't want to get a list of, you know, 25 items of $500 each, you know, that you're going to retrade on. You say, we've built enough padding in for capital expenses. We have those margins. We, you want that first deal to be as seamless as possible. I'm going to just enforce that as much as possible. You want that to be the easiest transaction that they've ever done in their entire multifamily career. You want that to be the case for the broker and for the seller. You want the seller to be the one feeling pressure to provide stuff and you are quick to respond just like that. They need a, a document, boom, there it is. I mean, don't lollygag, don't wait, get it to them. You drop what you're doing, you respond to the email immediately um, and make that as smooth as possible. Um, you don't want hiccups and everything. So within your power, make that first transaction. Once you've built that relationship and you've gotten the trust level to the point where, you know, they want to give you a deal, make sure that you make that as smooth as possible. And I can tell you, um, you know, that this is a big one. It's very big because there are groups that we've dealt with that are not that way. Okay. I'll give you and, and one instance, you know, a group will come in and they'll give you the offer that you want, maybe a little bit higher than all the rest of the groups. And the whole time they fully intend to retrade the deal for a large amount. They just want to get it under contract and then they're going to retrade the deal. And that may work one time. And then I will never award a deal to that group again um, because the seller obviously has the ability to choose. The broker is going to recommend, but the seller has the ability to choose. And I'm telling you right now, if a group does that to me, I will not transact with them again. Um, because I don't have time for that. So, you know, make sure that you pay attention to that point, make that first transaction, just bend over backwards. It may cost you a little bit of money, but in the long run, you're building a reputation. You're thinking of the long game. So make sure you keep that in mind. 
um, when you're getting that first transaction. So um, that's basically, you know, the, the first steps of this, the, the next step is the ways to maintain. So you've built, you've started the relationship, you've built the trust. And now how do you maintain that relationship? Um, a couple of the brokers put in some, some things that um, are good points. Um, if you have already purchased a deal from the broker, then they are hopefully sending you off market deals. These are deals that they have a relationship with the seller and they may be thinking of listing it on down the road, but if they can get what they want for it now, it saves them some time and some money to go ahead and get this deal sold off market. Off market typically means that there are, you know, a limited number of people looking at it, maybe 10, maybe five. On rare, rare occasions, are you the only one looking at it as a true, true off market? In other words, they're just giving you the diamond in the rough. I don't really see that happen too much. Off market tends to mean it's not fully listed or marketed publicly. And there's a small group of trusted buyers that are looking at it. Um, but one thing that you want to make sure if you get an off market deal, and this is coming directly from a broker, um, and this is something I'll, I'll tell you, I'll be really candid with you. This is something I learned by asking this question. I didn't, I, I didn't really think along those lines before that. So this is something I'm, I just learned that I'm sharing with you and that's get a, an offer in within 48 hours on an off market deal. Um, the reason for this is a lot of times because you're, um, the, the seller may be talking to a couple different brokers. And so they're all trying to get the right offer, um, you know, and whoever does get, you know, will get the sale. So they're trying to get it quickly in and be the first one with a good offer, um, you know, but make sure you, on an off market deal, get that offer in within 48 hours. That takes a lot of work. That's very difficult to do. Uh, that's gonna be based on solely comp research, you know, and market research on whatever platform you use in our case, CoStar. Um, you know, you, if you have time to tour the deal, a um, drive through, you won't be able to tour it because it's off market. Um, and just you know, do your best to get that in within 48 hours. Um, I already mentioned the pad offers. That's another way to help build a relationship or maintain a relationship, help the broker out, stay in contact constantly. Um, that is, you know, many times when I'm getting a lull in deal flow, I'm not seeing many things. I go ahead and pick up the phone and I make a few phone calls to the brokers. Hey, how's it going? What's going on? You know, how are things? How's the family? Um, and uh, got anything that we might be interested in. And just that simple phone call will spur, oh yeah, you know what? Um, I do have something you guys might like. And, you know, maybe it's a simple, they just forgot, or maybe that just came across their desk. I've had that happen. Oh, I just got something in today. I think you might like it. I'm glad you called me. Um, and you might be the first person to look at it because of that. So stay in contact. Um, be understanding um, with the buyer if you're selling a property and with the seller if you're buying a property and with the broker. They're, they're trying their best to facilitate this deal. Think the long game. I've seen groups who didn't get a deal awarded to them kind of get upset with the broker. Well, that's garbage. You know, we put a lot of work into this and spent a bunch of time and we toured it three times. And, you know, we've gotten all these debt quotes and everything else. And they get mad at the broker for not awarding the deal to them. And, you know, most of the time that's based on price and terms. So it was the buyer's fault, but they take it out on the, on the broker. And, and that's just not thinking long-term, you know, you win some, you lose some. Putting in the work uh, for deals that you don't get is part of this game. You, I mean, hundreds of deals. I mean, I just had some last week. You know, I've spent hours on those and we did not get them. It did not work out. Just move on. Um, give a thanks to, you know, the broker for, you know, spending the time turning the deal with you. Sorry, it didn't work out. Hey, we'll catch you on the next one. Do not let your pride get the best of you. Maintain that relationship. Um, and uh, on that point, our business model for broker relations is whoever sold us the deal will be who sells the deal for us. That's just, that doesn't have to be your criteria. That's just the way we do things, uh, because we're kind of returning the favor. Thank you for awarding this deal to us. Now here's some commission, you know, when you go to sell it, unless something's 
crazy has happened or there, you know, some, something's way off in the BOV. That's the way we roll. And I think that's a good piece of advice. We got that advice from a major multifamily operator, uh, you know, billion dollars, billions of dollars in portfolio, um, a very big player um, nationally um, that's well-respected. That's the, the advice that their acquisitions guy gave to us. So we play by that and make sure you find it mutual interest and go have some fun. Um, whether you like to play golf or you like the, uh, you know, if you're somewhere where they have a race car experience, you could do that or whatever it is, just try to find a mutual connection. Um, just make that connection, make it a little more personal. I mean, it is a business relationship. So, you know, it's not, you're not going to go crazy with this, but take it a little bit past business and try to be as personable as possible um, so that you can build that relationship um, so those are the, my tips um, for today. Those are the ones that I think are going to help you get to um, the success level that we have been thankful to achieve. Um, some of you um, are already there. Um, some of you are working on it. And we just hope that we can share the knowledge that we've acquired um, over the years and just share that with you and just let you know what works for us. It doesn't work for everybody, but it has worked for us. And so we want to um, make sure we pass on as much as possible. Um, so let me go again to some of the questions. Um, yeah. Oh, great question. Should the buyer use the broker's firm to fund debt or should the buyer shop around? Um, it's always good to shop around, but with agency, you're going to be pretty close to the same across the board. And um, some brokers are more, it's a good way to put this, um, more aggressive in their desire for you to use their debt team than others. Okay, I'll just put it that way and leave it there. Um, we've had firms that are borderline offended that we didn't use their debt team. And some that are like, hey, great, if you can, perfect. If not, perfect. Try to use the broker's debt team, if at all possible. We've had situations where um, it was a first time transaction with a broker. So first time transaction with our debt team, the terms that we had agreed to were tighter than normal and being unfamiliar with the way this debt team operated, we were uncomfortable using their debt team because you know our hard money was on the line. And so we went with the debt team that they used, but later on down the road, we had another deal that had normal terms and we went ahead and we, um, we went ahead and used their debt team because we want to do that. So if you're buying from NKF, use NKF's debt team. If you want to, you know, if you're using JLL, try to use their debt team. Um, Walker Dunlap, uh, CBRE, um, all of those have uh, debt teams. And there's usually, um, you know, I don't know what the, the commission structure is on that, but obviously the broker is getting some type of kickback towards that or the team is. And so be aware of that. You know, if you scratch their back, they're going to scratch your back. So try to work uh, as closely as possible on that. So yes, I, I would agree to use the debt team. Um, just be careful about communication um, on that. Uh, sometimes you may, depending on who it is, may want to sign a non-disclosure. So, you know, if you're talking about, you know, something with a deal that may be problematic, you, you might not necessarily want the debt team going back and talking with the broker. That does not necessarily happen, but, you know, just be aware of that, that, you know, there might be some back channeling there. Um, sometimes uh, we haven't had that be the case where it was um, detrimental to the deal, but just be aware that, that could happen. Um, and we have a question. Yeah. Will you get a recording of this webinar? And uh, yes, uh, that'll go out after this uh, webinar is completed. Um, if you don't have a tool like CoStar, is it okay to ask for an underwriting report from the broker? How is the best way to get the cap rate for a specific market? Um, the best way, if you don't have CoStar, is to, you can ask for a report from the broker. Um, some of them are not allowed to give that information out um, because of the subscription with whatever uh, data service they're using. Um, I think a better way would be to go through your third-party management company and get the report from them. And also you can, because you're going to be getting a pro forma report, that's what their expenses um, are going to be for this 
particular property and uh, some sales comps. And that is the best way to determine the cap rate is look at prior sales. And it, a lot of times they can list, I know CoStar lists the cap rate um, ratios for sales that have occurred in the submarket. Uh, so, I mean, if you're in this a lot, you're going to get a feel for the cap rate kind of if something's way out of whack, then there's something wrong with income on the property. There may be a lot of upside. A lot of brokers will sell you on the upside. And so the cap, the entry cap rate is going to be super low, like 50 basis below what the normal market would be. But that what they're saying is, well, you'll pay a little bit more up front, but look at all the upside or all the cash flow that you can achieve because they're so underperforming you know, they're doing such a bad job. You can just move this thing up. Um, you know, that's not always the best scenario. Um, you know, I don't want to pay somebody for their lack of operation skills, but you will see that occasionally. So you'll get a feel for the cap rate as you get further along in the industry. Um, cap rates have compressed quite a bit since uh, we've been in this. So, um, you know, your metro areas, you know, in the Southeast are, you know, between four and five, I'll put it that way. Um, they vary all through there, but they, they've gone down quite a bit. Um, so that's, um, you know, something you just have to take into consideration, but cap rate really doesn't drive it as much. It just kind of gives us a benchmark and uh, are we overpaying for this deal? Um, overpaying for the deal is not necessarily a deal breaker as long as that overpaying for the deal does not hurt your DSCR, your debt service coverage ratio, which therefore hurts your LTV loan to value. Um, and therefore, you know, kills your cash flow and everything else. So that's really what you're paying attention to more specifically than cap rate. Uh, but if you're dealing with investors, you know, if you're syndicating, obviously, like we are, if you give something to investors and it's, they're going to do some research and it's below cap rate by, you know, 40 basis, they're going to be like, what, what's going on? Why am we overpaying for this deal? I, you know, it might put some questions in their mind immediately. So just be aware of that. Um, again, it's not a deal breaker, but just be aware of what's going on there. Um, let's see. And you got a question on how to work with property managers. Um, so the property manager, you know, just, you know, kind of related to this, uh, but not necessarily, but uh, property managers are going to, you're going to need to pick somebody that is very familiar with your sub market. So if you're, let's say you're buying in Phoenix and you're buying in Charlotte, um, your property management company in Charlotte probably doesn't have a presence in Phoenix. And so you're going to want to do some research in the Phoenix market to see who's strong there and get some references there. Um, Cause you want a group that's very familiar with the sub market. That's been there for a while. They know all the properties, they know all the regional managers and all the rest of it. And they can give you good feedback um, on the sub market. Because if you get a group that's just kind of looking from the outside in, like you can do yourself with CoStar, their data may not be as accurate. And so um, their pro formas may not be as accurate as what the sub market actually reflects. So uh, choose a property manager based on the sub markets that you are in um, and not just on a company wide basis necessarily. Um, we haven't necessarily that I can remember done a, a webinar on how to work with um, the property managers, but the property managers are an integral part of the underwriting process. Um, we have our pro forma numbers. We want them to produce their own pro forma numbers. That is their expenses and their income, especially other income, what they think they can achieve, again, based on the knowledge of the submarket. Um, cause we want them to project what they can achieve. We don't want to set them up for failure and make them achieve what we have projected because they are the professionals. Use the professionals around you, rely on your team. You're going to verify, you know, with your own data and make sure it's not out of whack or too far, you know, one way or the other, high or low. Uh, but we work heavily with the property managers. I do a lot of tours with the property management company, um, and they will give us, uh, feedback on, you know, what to do with CapEx. So I think this will work, or I think this is, this will work because right around the corner, that's what they have here. And I've, I used to manage that property years ago with this other company I used to manage with. So that type of feedback is invaluable. Um, and I definitely like to uh, include them if I can. Um, again, communicate early and often, rely on your team um, as much as possible. So that is, looks like all that we have for today. Next week's webinar is successful asset management. 
Um, so that's going to be more along the lines. Those are asking about, um, you know, property managers. That's going to be a great call for you. Um, I had a question about a specific management company. I don't want to get really into talking about specific companies um, because that will, their experience will vary depending on their specific group. And I don't want to, you know, say anything negative or positive necessarily that will lead someone astray. So I'll, I'll refrain from naming uh, property management companies too much here, um, except for the, uh, some of the ones that we use, we mention uh, sometimes in those, but as far as ones that we don't use, I, I don't want to get into that. Uh, but next week, let me see if I can uh, refresh this page. Um, and it took me to that. So um, that's the webinar page. So apologize about that. Um, we, uh, next week, again, Danny, will be on the webinar and he'll be talking about uh, successful asset management. Um, that's his role with the company um, through our asset manager, Brian. Um, and let me see if I can get this page to pull up. All right, there we go. All right, there you go. So go ahead and register for the webinar. Um, right there, there's, um, the link is in the, um, in the chat box. So you can go ahead and get that going. Uh, be sure to, to uh, check that out. And uh, we hope to see all of you uh, soon again, another webinar and again at our summit. And uh, I hope everybody has a good and productive day today.